Rob, what's going on, man? Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Our paths meet again. Our paths meet yes, again. Sir. Once again. And uh, this time, I would really like to learn a little bit more about how in the hell you got from being a you know, 11, 12-year-old skateboarder and then becoming a pro skater into now having a venture creation studio, creating over like almost a half a billion dollars in exits now and um, becoming, becoming really the uh, pinnacle of what most people are looking to become in entrepreneurship and how you're able to get there. So I would love, love to kind of rewind the clock, set some context for those listening. Talk to me about seven, eight, nine-year-old Rob, like take us back to then set the scene. What was life like for you? What were your parents up to? And then we'll kind of go from there. Uh, you know, father was a suit salesman. Mother was a stay-at-home mom. Um, became obsessed with Taekwondo. Uh, when I found out I could break boards with my fists, felt like I was a ninja. Got my first uh, set of nun nunchucks. Uh, nunchucks until I, I sliced off the head of a, a garden snake and my mom took them away. Um, I then became obsessed with soccer. Um, you know, I would, you know, to give you context of the really young 10, 11 year old version of myself, I would like stare at a blank TV with like uh, the, the white fuzz and eat oranges and to prepare myself to go play soccer. And then I would just like score like seven or eight goals, like every single game. Like I was like obsessed Savage from day one. You know what I mean? Like I was like, I, I would lock in and get super like into things at like a really, really young age. Um, and, and again, you know, my, I had this great blend of growing up in the Midwest and having a lot of freedom as, as you gave to kids in Ohio, because you didn't really know much better. Now, of course, I was raised in a fixed mindset household, and I went to a fixed mindset school where I got a fixed mindset education, but I had this great blend of optimism from my father of like, you know, you can do anything, like I can do anything, you can do anything like that was like general with this balance of you can't like do what you should do. Like you need to go to college, go to school, get an education, be careful on my mm -hmm. mom's side. So I ended up with this perfect sort of straight line blend that sort of shaped me. And then I just had early successes. Um, at, at those early ages, getting really good at Taekwondo and then being really good at soccer laid sort of the foundation of when I got a skateboard finally at 11, I got really good at that. And then it was like, oh, I'm going to be a pro skateboarder. Nothing's going to stop this. And that's sort of like the first big, big idea and dream that I laid down and then just went and did, you know. Selfishly, I got to ask you this question uh, because I have a two and a half year old son, he's almost two and a half. And then my daughter is uh, almost 11 months. And so anytime I get the opportunity to talk with someone who has a little bit more experience in this, and even from the context of your parents parenting you, and they seemed to do a pretty good job at fostering, cultivating, uh, like you said, this um, uh, uh, mentality that allowed you to go out and take big risks and become the person that you, that you wanted to become. Any, any, parenting advice th that you have and anything that that you've maybe learned picked up over the years that uh, you would suggest to you know young parents that are trying to foster this same creativity and boldness to go after your dreams I mean look you know I, I think you're you're going to be shaped by your experiences right and when I think about my think about it I was raised by a super paranoid be safe like like don't take risk mother and then a super optimistic anything's possible father now i went out and attempted these things at an early age and, and found success so i believed in him mm -hmm. right so i no longer like all the stuff she was saying well that's not true because everything that i keep putting my mind to and keep doing that you said i couldn't do so i but that was shaped by the choices i made the experiences that happened in the luck that came my way in that process, because if those would have failed, if I would have gotten injured and not been able, these 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 sort of things could have turned me towards her mentality yeah. just as quickly, right? When I think about like how lucky I was in the shaping process of who I ultimately became, and and for me, you know, I you know. We, 
everybody will tell you we your kids are going to learn by how and who you are right so i i think fundamentally it starts with like energy like to me it's always life's amazing i tell them i love work working works amazing like i'm trying to pull apart this this paradigm construct that work is this thing that you do in between getting to do the things you love to do. Right. Mm, So I want them to grow up like feeling that work is amazing, grow up in this energy. And then I, I want like them to fall in love with learning and the power of learning before it turns into you learning is what you do at school that you hate to do it's a chore right it's like eating your vegetables right so true yeah and and you know and and i try to really like you know my son is five years old We, we got a broken toilet in his in his bathroom and i you know i kept trying to show him how to fix it himself and he's like i can't i can't lift it up and all this stuff and he finally figured out how to do it. And then he now rushes in there, pops it up and did it himself. And he's like, you see that I did it. And, and like, I'm like, I'm like, you see the feeling you have son. Like at first it's always hard, like, because you don't understand it. you got to learn it. That's what learning is. And then you learned it. Then now you built that confidence. Now you went and did it and look at you, look how much fun you have and how proud of uh, you, of how proud you are. You did it. I'm proud of you. He's like, I'm so proud of myself. Right. And so I'm trying to show that that's learning and like learning and evolving is like the key to life. Right. Mm, And today he even put on his seatbelt for the first time in his booster seat. And he's like, look what I learned. I'm like, that's learning. Right. So I'm trying to peer through like, into these fundamental things that I that I can hope instill and then shape in them that become a part of who they are. Yeah. Um, you know, outside of the core value of being a good person and knowing what and kind to everyone and being thoughtful and work hard and 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 of course I drive it into a whole other level as it's related to like you know, what type of company do you want to start? You know, and like, you know, I want to start, you know, he'll pitch me ideas at five. Like I want to do a water bottle company. I said, son, a lot of water bottle companies out there. So what is going to make yours different in the marketplace? And he'll be like, I'm gonna put dinosaurs on mine. I'm like, there you go. Right. And it's like, but what, what are we doing? We're, I'm just, even if like, you know, I'm, he evolves into being an entrepreneur, you know, no different than if LeBron James's child evolves into being a great basketball player, because it's what I love and have a passion for and want to share and see in him. Yeah. Um, but it's these foundational aspects that we as parents get to get to shape their existence. We, we, we get to decide what input they have on what's going to be the foundation that, that then that at some point will be shaped by the outside world and their experiences. And, and so I just try to never like take that for granted. Right. I, you know, we live in a loving, beautiful household, you know, and part of living this super balanced uh, life that I have, I take them to school every day. I pick them up every day. I take them, I I take them to soccer. I get them up from nap. I put them down for nap. Like it still feels like I'm, I'm always there and always a part of their lives. Right. And, and that's what I want like to, to be in like who we are as a family means so much like, and is like a priority in, in our, in our world. And that's just sort of, you know, at, at the really young age, like two is like, you're just beginning the process of, 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 you know, communicating. Um, But I, I mean, look, I made them say when my kids were one and a half and two every morning, um, that I would tell them you can do anything and, and say why. And they would say, because I believe in myself, like sense, mm. like, and we would say it to them before they could talk. Right. And again, I don't know. I'm just thinking of like all these things that were part of a foundation for me yeah. that I want to continue to add and be thoughtful of, because I know that there is so much that you can do at this stage to actually help build that foundation that they can now grow off of for the rest of their life. You know? Yeah. I'm, I wanted to ask that question because I knew you'd have a pretty good answer. I know how structured you guys make your life and uh, it's something that, uh, that I think a lot of us could learn from. So I appreciate you taking time to answer that question uh, to kind of get back into your story specifically. 
uh, you were, uh, you know, entrepreneurial, you're doing these things, whatever you put your mind to, you wanted to be the best at, uh, why skateboarding? Why, why was that something that you decided to pick up? You know, I played team sports, you know, I was in Taekwondo, you know, I'm, um, I, you know, I tried like T-ball at some point, you know, I didn't connect with basketball or football. And, and, and I think it was like, I was, I was also pretty creative naturally loved art at a really like young age. And I think it was that idea of you were able to make skateboarding, whatever you wanted it to be. Right. It, it already came innately, like even how I discovered it, my sister's boyfriend who I idolized was uh, the first skater that I knew, you know, and, and he had spiked hair and he had bandana, four bandanas on each arm, four <laughs> bandanas on each leg and a spiked like a uh, belt across the chest and waist. And I'm like, wow, this, <laughs> I, this is like, that's me. And like, I literally got a spiked haircut, got four bandanas on each arm and, and each leg and a spiked belt across the chest, got a, bought my first skateboard from him. And I marched into J.E. Press Elementary School as the coolest kid alive, you know what I mean? And really... I just connected with that individualism yeah. and it was where I could then, you know, blend that with my athleticism. And, and again, it's, it's, it's one of those sports where it's sort of limitless by design and there's no range in the progression that yeah. you can go through. So when I began to like see tricks and learn tricks and then like a new trick and, a, and, a, and then a combination of a trick, it, I became then addicted to sort of that, that relentless progression and evolution that I got to control by spending four hours in the garage. And now I had five new tricks compared to my friends the next day. Like it was that sort of aspect of it that I really, really connected with. So then it's four or five years later and you actually do it and you can turn pro, like become a professional skateboarder. What's going through your parents' minds at this point? Like, as, as I mean, you're 16 years old getting offered a deal. I think it was from DC. Is that right? No, DC was a, a, a few years later, like okay. after I moved to California. But th look, you got to understand, I got sponsored by, I went, I cold called the skate shop because they had a ramp there and I'd never skated a ramp before and said, if oh, I got 10 right. people this to is, come this is and alien. Pay, yeah, this is before alien, right? Okay. This is Ohio uh, surf and skate. But gotcha. I went and skated that ramp. They, they sponsored me on the spot, right? So again, you know, I took the initiative, called the skate shop. What can I do to skate for free? I don't have any money. And uh, can I get 10 people to pay? And would you let me skate for free? They thought it was funny. They're just like, why don't you just come down and then we'll let you skate. And then I skated the ramp for the first time, was doing all these tricks that I saw in like magazines. And like, they're like, if this is the first time you are riding a ramp, like, you're going to be really, really good. Right. And they sponsored me. So then I, my dad started taking me there all the time. And then I eventually got sponsored by GNS, uh, which was a, a, a company out of San Diego that the two guys that I knew from Ohio uh, that worked there. And then they were the ones that wanted to turn me pro. But then we did, they decided they were going to move back to Ohio and start the alien workshop. And I turned pro for the alien workshop. And, you know, what do your parents and your counselors and everyone else think when you're living in Ohio and you want to quit high school to be a professional skateboarder? They're like, no chance. This is you can't. You're ruining your life. You're ruining your life. And my again, here we sit in two places, right? My my dad saying, like, look, he's gotten this good and they want to make him a pro, like, let him do it. Like my mom saying, saying, like, no, he can't. He's got to go to college. He's got to graduate, or else he's like gonna be a loser, <laughs> you know. And maybe not that, but that was, you know, probably in that range. And then the counselor, of course, is like, I don't know. Like, I guess, like, I guess he's pro already. So there's like that, you know, like it was sort of a mixed bag of of. Uh, emotions and navigation as it related to parents, which I can relate to now. Yeah. Um, but back then it was like, this is ridiculous. I'm turning pro and not going to school. I don't even know why we're having the discussion. I was going to ask, yeah, like, did, you know did, what I mean? You, like I did, wasn't did, contemplating it. It was, did, a, it was like, <laughs> like, okay, well, I'm not going to be here. Yeah. So how do, what should we do about that? You know what I mean? So, so there, there was then, never like in your mind, you had the freedom to make the decision because like 
I mean, what are you going to do? I'm going to do it anyway. So, yeah. And, and you're, and you're born with that. Like you're born, you're, you're given the freedom to develop that. Then once you develop that, then you don't ever let that go. Yeah, right. So and, and it becomes your, and then, you know, it, it, and again, like I said, I got lucky because I was bold. Then I would take risks and then they would work. And so all that did was layer the foundation of belief that I had in myself so deep that that allowed me to like manage, you know, failure and and things that didn't work out as simply just like I could justify it through a handful of things in it, but it would never deter me to then push to the next thing and try to push forward in that thing. And and I think that's a, a lot of people are or go through that same process and have a couple of those go south. And now you're gun shy. You change that boldness softens up a little bit and and you kind of evolve the way that you, you kind of get in. I'm when I think about what are some of those foundational things that happened throughout those early years that did compound on each other to allow me to eventually be able to expand into doing so many uh, unthinkable things, uh, even, even at that age, yeah. um, that I would go on to do, you know, what, what were your goals at that point? Like when, when you decided <clears throat> that you were going to, you know, become a pro skateboarder at that point, it, like what, what, what was like, man, that would be so crazy if I could do this, or if I could go there or be a part of this thing, like what were the wildest dreams for you at that point? Yeah. You know, I, I think, I think I was so bent on getting to California, right turning pro moving to California and starting a company, right? So it starting was a company like was always bang, a part of it. Bang, bang, bang. Yeah. Because you got, you got to like the, the 19 year old kid that owned the skate shop uh, was a serial entrepreneur. It was his skate shop. He started all these other businesses. I worked in one of his businesses, a, a distributor to save enough money to go to California for the first time when I was 14 uh, to stay with Mike Hill, who moved back to Dayton, Ohio and launched the alien workshop. Like, so I watched, you know, all these guys launch company after company. And then those guys come back, launch this company that I now turned pro for like the other close friends around me were launching clothing companies and this stuff while I'm like 15, 16. Mm. So in my mind, I'm not, there's not even, it wasn't a matter of like, oh, am I going to start a company? It's like, when's the, yeah. it's the first thing that I'm going to do once I what get to California. What am I going to start? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, you know, no sooner did I like, you know, move to Lucadia, California, then did I connect with a manufacturer and distribute out there and build my first company? I was doing some research beforehand and <clears throat> saw that when, after you made your deal with DC, uh, they, you know, sponsored you, but then you didn't stop there, right? Like you were also at that point, even still looking, almost being like an entrepreneur, right? This this term that people use to describe entrepreneurial type employees within a certain ecosystem or whatever. So this is you coming in, you get sponsored. And then you're like, what if I also start designing some shoes, right? Like, can I make some money doing that? And it ended up going out like pretty well for you for a while. Right. Yeah. I mean, look, it's, you know, I'm, we could call it entrepreneuring, but it's like, it's, it's, basically searching for opportunity yeah. inside your ecosystem um, that that is unique to your skill set right and and your relationships inside the ecosystem so what am i i'm a pro skateboarder who uh, unlike the other pro skateboarders who were given signature shoes from DC, I hand sketched my own design and did the entire thing and presented to like, this is what I want uh, my shoe to be. And this is what I want to um, like make it to make it like a Nike, like athletic skate shoe. Right. So it was like that. They, they began to see like, like, and again, what's this go back to? It goes back to that design and creative sort of uh, foundation that I had uh, and developed in high school while I was there. I took all art classes mainly, right? And so as I really began, I learned footwear design. So now I understood it well enough. And now I, I, I began to understand the footwear market. 
So as it, when it came time to renegotiate a deal, I knew that like, okay, I'm maxed here. I'm, I'm maxed on how much money I'm ever going to make from a single shoe. I get a 5% royalty and like this signature shoe, um, it, it's like the, the size of like, uh, how many shoes you could actually sell was limited by the distribution at that point. Right. And so when I, but I loved that, that the insanity of the royalty check, I, <laughs> I, I mean, the most life changing like moment of my life is like when I had a $45,000 royalty check for my first signature shoe that I walked into bank of America to deposit. I felt like I was, I might as well had a check for like $50 million. It was just like, <laughs> duh. Yeah. I'd like to deposit as I filled out the deposit slip and took it on up there and slid that. In. I felt like the richest man alive you know yeah. and and but i loved the construct of a royalty i'm like ah oh, it's like how amazing and so i began to then see opportunities inside the line of shoes that the designers and the sales team just weren't making right mm, yeah. and because i was doing it and making these innovative shoes for my signature shoes that were going and selling really well and so I proposed, and then I had I had a really great relationship with Ken Block, who ran the company. So I would negotiate with him one on one on my deals. And so when my new deal came up, I proposed a deal structure that was, you know, let me go through the same process as the designers. You don't have to pay me more. Let me go through the same process. Let me do pitches the same way they do pitches. And then if they pick my shoe, then I get a 2% royalty on it. And so, you know, you know, Rob wants to design shoes, you know, cool. Let's, you know, like we could do, he's creative and has a bunch of good ideas. And besides his pro shoes, like, yeah, like, cool, let's do it. Then I went so hard, right? <laughs> then what did I do? I, I would go, I would study the market. I would make, I would see what's trending. I would then present the most outrageous presentations to the sales force. So now what is it? It's Rob Deerdeck, who's already the pro skater, right? He's now like done these way more over the top like thorough presentations and he's out here razzle dazzling you with his like entertainment and 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 fun for his designs what ends up happening i end up designing a third of the entire line right and so now i i am making so much money from royalties way beyond my wildest dreams way beyond like any other pro skateboarder in the entire industry and then when the the uh, DC was acquired by uh, Quicksilver, it was like so confusing to them of like, why does Rob Deerdeck have like 30 signature shoes? You know what I mean? Like, you know, they were essentially like, this is like, um, you know, something that we we can't do like we yeah, pay like the how, designers how can we justify paying yeah. these prices for you know, these designs or whatever and yeah. and at that time it just sort of like i knew that the writing was on the wall and it was right around the time that i was developing sort of robin big uh in the mtv show and i i really looked now to like okay how do i maximize the opportunity that may come from uh, this new media exposure is what I really pointed my energy at inside DC at that time, you know. And how did that end up coming about? <clears throat> like, how do you make the transition from being, you know, entrepreneurial, pro skateboarder, shoe designer, you know, so many hats that you're wearing, but then you're also like, nah, now I want to be on TV. Like, well, where do well, you start you know, in that thought process? How do you begin to put those pieces together? Yeah. And again, none of, none of this, you got to think I had record labels at the time, like skate shops, clothing lines. I had so many different companies that I started um, inside that same sort of time zone. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I've, I've always kind of had like one through line, you know, that, that was like pro skateboarding was the through line before TV became the through line that I built opportunity got off it. of. Right. Got it. And so uh, dabbling and doing all of these different things, different businesses. You know, I wrote a feature film and was getting getting that funded. I had started my foundation and started building the skate plazas um, 
you know, all over the country did my first um, sort of beta version of Street League way before TV. So I was already like, like, you know, like laying the foundation for a lot of the businesses and different things I would go and build in the future, um, overlapping as I always have the same way that today, you know, the fact that I built, you know, 18 companies and sold six for $500 million over the last you know, few years is not because I just started in 16 and did it. It's because I was, I was overlapping all of these, these same sort of the same sort of philosophy of the through line at that, that point, at uh, this point, which would have been television as I continued to evolve and build these sort of new, new careers and new sort of opportunities based off of stuff that was presented to me. And in the case of Robin big, it was born out of the idea that that I the DC company was doing a video and I wanted to write a funny skit for a skate video. And it was simply just to go around my skate tricks, this idea that I'm going to bring a security guard to deal with security guards. And it was just just to be funny and do something bigger than than just a skate part. And then it just blew up, you know, and me and him had just such natural chemistry that you know we ended up doing a car race across Europe together called the Gumball 3000 and the, <laughs> there was a film being directed about it and the director uh featured us and then when we got back to Los Angeles was like man you you guys should do a television show together and at that time I was like I don't have time to do a television show like I, it was so, I, I, so foreign to me, like the idea of like putting time and energy when I was like, like, you know, doing so well with like the shoe designs and beginning to build the skate parks and beginning to build my league, the foundation for my league and writing, like creating the film. Like I had all these other ambitions at that time, including my other business ventures. And then, you know, he then connected to Jeff Tremaine, who did Jackass and Big Brother, who I knew from Big Brother. And then when we talked, it became much easier, mm -hmm. right? It was like, hey, all we got to do is shoot like uh, 10 or 15 minutes and go walk it in. I can walk it into MTV and then they'll tell you whether or not there's a show there. So it was like, wow, OK, this this becomes much easier. And um that like process then allowed me to create in there right then i'm like ah it's like then i came up i brought in the song people let me tell you about my best friend like brought that in and like called it best friends right and was like trying to sell it as like the odd couple yeah. right but at, at that time there just wasn't really comedy reality shows right yeah, there was a right. little bit of like like family comedy and the Osbournes and and the newlyweds right but not like where it's just comedy right like those are kind of a mix of drama and comedy and and so like um they were willing to take a shot at it but they they weren't fully they weren't open to the idea of the buddy comedy hearing me lay out the vision for it and where it all came from and all this stuff they're like this is the guy and so they didn't buy best friends they bought the show Rob Deerdeck's Rules to Success. And rule number one was always surround yourself with good people. And that was Big Black in the first episode, right? And when we shot it, you know, it was, you know, it was fully scripted. It was like, like, so like and in our very first scene of a scripted scene that we were supposed to hit all these points. Like the first thing was about us going to prison. And I was like, well, you wouldn't, he'd like, I get you in prison. Like you'd be, you'd be who I was hunting for. I'm like, man, you wouldn't be able to catch me. You know what I mean? Like just immediately turned into like, oh bro, you ain't, let's tell you, you ain't, I'll tell you what you ain't going to do is catch me in a foot race. I could, I could outrun you. I could outrun you, son. And it like, just went off script into this whole banter then we should race then let's do you couldn't even come like went into and that was like essentially the 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 stuff that we didn't listen to what they wanted we just went off on which eventually became they recognized as wow like this this relationship between them is the heart of this show which then became ultimately became robin big you know <clears throat> man it, there's a constant theme it seems like with basically everything that you've been successful at, which is action first and, uh, and then, and then, you know, building the plane on the way down, uh, is what comes after that. 
And it seems like this is just another example that led into other multiple uh, arenas uh, that continue to obviously build your brand. And now you own what, 40, 50, 60% of, of all of MTV with ridiculousness or something like that is what I heard. Yeah. I mean, look, that's, it's 60% of all their programming. And it's like, again, I don't, you know, there's, there's a lot of miraculous things that sort of happened over time that, that course, led yeah. to that. Right. Like in the fact that linear, cause you can imagine here, here's why in a simple idea is through the, through the course of the show, linear cable flattened because streaming exploded. Then, then sort of what happened to network television and cable television, it's almost like there was sort of a, a the value proposition of the content that the audience loves the most from that network, like basically stuck. It's competition shows and 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 crime shows on network. It's sort of a hero show on all the cable channels. And then you binge watch all your streaming is what it is. And then what happened in that is then ridiculousness actually became this entirely new uh, way to watch television when you didn't feel like streaming. You didn't feel like waiting for a competition show on network. You could just like you could land in the show at any moment and watch it for 45 minutes, two hours, leave the room, come back. It, 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 it served this entirely new purpose in television and in, in content, if you will, that laid to support the viewing habits of all of the other sort of major distribution channels of content between YouTube, network television, regular cable and streaming. And that's luck. Yeah, that's boy, I tell you what. Like that's luck, you know, now when I, when I designed it and developed it, I read an article with Vinnie DeBona about him having a $500 million syndication business with America's funniest home videos. And I thought to myself, man, I can make the faster, cooler version of that. Yeah, that shows yeah. so slow and it's filled with all this fat. Like if I just like strip it down and make it fast, like, that's like um, a modern way to do it, how I would want to watch it. Cause that was even really before YouTube had really like, had right. really got cooking um, at scale too. But again, you, you, you're the right man, right vision, like, and, and created something and then made it work. But then you got lucky along the way and market factors that are on, you could have never even seen coming that took the idea itself to a, a level you could have never fathomed, you know? Yeah. It's so funny, dude. Cause like two, two, three days ago, my dad was like, yeah, I was, uh, I was watching this, this show the other day, uh, it's called ridiculousness. And, uh, this thing happened on there. He was like telling me about some, you know, funny thing he was describing to me. And I was like, you know, I'm interviewing the, the host of that in like two or three days. He's like, oh, really? What's his name? And I was like, his, his name is Rob. You know, it was just like a, just kind of like full circle <laughs> moment that happened to be like two days before we're jumping on this interview. Yeah. Where like even my dad is sitting there at like his hotel room in some random place, you know, before he goes into a business meeting watching Ridiculousness on MTV, which is a channel that he would normally never tune into. You know what right. I mean? It speaks to that. It, 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 like you said, you can turn it on whenever, watch it whenever. Anybody can watch it and get it and think it's funny. Yeah. And it's like six to 60, man. It, it, it like yeah, really right. is like, there's no demo for it. It always rates. And, and, you know, in, in, a, in, you know, since I built the production company, own the production company, I was able to then even negotiate more off of the changing landscape of the, the advertising dollars and linear cable. So since again, I'm approaching how like from a talent and creative perspective and a business perspective. So even the partnership that I had with the network was on a much more sophisticated. How do, how do we both make this win at a really high level? And, and then again, we, we, we got the show into a unit economic place that was great for them. Then that, then they ordered way more. Then they started airing way more. They aired way more, more people started to watch it. And it, it took on this even bigger evolution beyond that, you know, 
positioned myself for all of this stuff, was smart enough to create all of this and be multidimensional and highly dynamic within the opportunities as I always have been. Right. But boy, oh boy, market factors, market timing, getting a little bit, getting, get, getting lucky and things, things hitting and working at the right time is where a lot of this, this, this really like, really like unexplainable high level of success comes from, you know? Yeah, it's it's a seemingly a direct product of your growth mindset that you had since the time you were a little kid is get into something new. Maybe I don't understand how it works right now, but give me some time and I'll figure it out instead of just being another person that signed a contract as talent and getting your paycheck and and then doing whatever else you wanted to do. There was like, well, how does this work? What? Like, how come this show gets paid that much for that spot? How come, why can't we do like all these questions, this curiosity that you're constantly feeding has seemingly led you down this path of just figuring out more and more things and acquiring more knowledge and becoming a more valuable person along, along the way. So um, I <clears throat> kind of got reignited to following some of your stuff recently because I have a startup, which is kind of how we connected. And uh, we did an episode on, on, build with Rob on your podcast to talk a little bit about, give me some advice around building my, um, uh, my software application. And I, you know, I'd follow, I'd, I'd watch ridiculousness and, and all this other stuff. And I, I kind of already followed your stuff, but then I saw that you did an episode on my buddy, Jordan Harbinger's show. And I tuned in cause I, you know, Jordan's a friend of mine, but he's also like one of the best interviewers I think that exists inside of podcasting. And so I always know he's going to have a good conversation and probably get stuff that other people haven't talked about. So I listened to the episode and found out about the deer deck machine through listening to that episode and then did a bunch of other research and started to realize like, wow, the, like you didn't, you, you, the, the thing that I really respect and appreciate about your presence in the world is that you never stop reinventing who you are. You're, you're always tweaking, you're always testing, you're always experimenting and, and, and optimizing, if you will, your life, the way that you live, the way that you, like even your family life, the way that you spend your time, the way that you uh, decide what opportunities to pounce on and what opportunities to say no to. Um, and I started becoming really fascinated with that. So can you, can you really walk us through the decision to start the Deer Deck Machine, where that even came from? And then uh, talk to us about a couple of things that you're excited about that you got working over there. Uh, you know, it, it, the, I've always been a serial entrepreneur, right? And, you know, e even when I built Fantasy Factory, I owned the platform and I built businesses through it and did integrations through it. And, and that was through the guise of Deer Deck Enterprises, you know, and, and you know, had built multiple businesses throughout the years. Um, but I, you know, I, I was, I invested in a ton of different things. I acquired businesses. I did a lot of different just like the more money I would make, the more risk I would take um, is sort of like what my journey was as a serial entrepreneur. And I, and I, and I, I up until a certain point, I still wasn't fully educated on money. I wasn't fully educated on, on sort of operations of a, of a business and the finance side of a business. I was really brand and marketing guy, mm -hmm. right? Like I could, I, I had like a product mind and a brand mind and like, how do we tell the story and amplify it? Right. I think that's like what, what my strength was. And then, you know, I would partner with different people that had great businesses like DC that allowed me to get a lot of scale. And, and, and I started a ton of ventures that didn't, that didn't work. And I didn't fully understand why. And then some stuff I'd start and it would really work, you know, and, in, in, in that, in that era, you know, I had a cartoon on Nickelodeon that I created. I had fantasy factory, ridiculousness, street league. I did street dreams. Like I was building skate parks all over the place and starting company after company, loud mouth burritos. I had deals with like credit card companies at startups, like all types of stuff. Right. And I would essentially like spend the money I earned, right? The post-tax dollars that I had left, I would reinvest in all these things that I wanted to create, you know, but I didn't have a sense of like what, how it was going to generate value and where the payoff was going to be. Mm. I just figured that I'll just keep doing like I always did and just keep like going as hard as I can, recognizing new opportunities and build into those and and what had happened at one point is when I 
was introduced to, to venture capital and an investment banker who said, hey, you could raise money for your, your skateboard league. That led to me learning about venture capital and sort of the construct of the capital markets and how they work in private equity and venture and 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 high net worth investments because up to that point I had I had invest I had financed everything myself my entire life I'd never wow. had anybody I either had partners that co-invested to build something that we were partners in it or like no one ever gave me money to do something in my life right I, I thought an investment banker was a someone that dealt with high net worth individuals at banks not someone that was a middleman and raising money and so like. I was presented this concept of we would like to do a 360 deal with you. We would like to like um, own half of everything you do for the rest of your life because we think like if we help you that there's it's limitless on what you could create. Now, when they did the diligence on me uh, to do uh, the 360 deal, it was this like painful like reality check of how much I didn't understand business. I didn't understand my own business. I didn't, I wasn't creating value. I was just making money and spending money. And so they essentially offered to loan me money uh, to help me figure it out and then have the right to own half of me once they helped me figure it out. And it was so painful. And I knew that like I needed to begin this journey of, like, like not only understanding myself more and what it was that truly made me happy and what I wanted to do, but what type of entrepreneur did I want to be and what, what did I love about creating businesses? And more than anything, I wanted to learn every single thing that there was about business. And I stopped and I went out to a bunch of consultants um, trying to find somebody to essentially help me build a, a business creation system that I would now create businesses through and run businesses through, then figure out in there what I love to do the most in business, and then only do that, and then hire people to run the other side of it. And that genesis led to hiring all these really smart people that, that allowed me to begin to put together this entire system that then as the system evolved, it was like, oh, this is a machine, right? And, and this machine's output is companies. It's a business that creates businesses, right? And that really was sort of the, the beginning of, of um, you know, the my version of venture capital, right? Uh, and then after launching it in 2016, I just went wild style. Like I just did company after company after company uh, in those first couple years. And then, then I took a year off. Like I did it by myself. Like um, I had all outsourced resources and two assistants. And I launched in that first year, like literally like, like eight companies. Right. And this is a variety of different stages, all pre-revenue, like early stage, either co-founded them and started them or like helped develop them at uh, the very beginning. Um, and like, then it was like, that was sort of my beta years. And, and even in there, in 2016, in the summer of 2016, I launched it and I started to do press and podcasts. I did Lewis, I did Tom Bilyeu, I did some, some other interviews and stuff, but I realized like, man, I'm only talking about what I'm going to do. I'm just talking about what I'm going to do. I went through this journey between 2013 and 16 and learned, basically went to college and learned everything there is. And now I have this system and this vision, but that's just what I'm going to do, right? Like, and then I went back in and stopped talking about it and then just built business after business. In 2017, bought, brought Brian Atlas over who was, the, who was running Street League, my league to come in and be COO of the machine. We basically then re-engineered uh, the 2.0 version of the our system and process. Through that process, I really understood and learned capital staging and and sort of cash flow management um, and cash management and, and that sort of range. And then, um, you know, really began to look at business through not the lens of brand and business, but, you know, product 
brand, media, marketing, sales, operation, finance, and leadership. I began to see business more multidimensionally and look for CEOs and entrepreneurs that had that skill set. I began to be understand markets better. And, and so again, in 2016, my goal was I want to create a billion dollars in liquidity by building and selling 30 to 50 businesses that I uh, own um, 20 to 70 percent of and are sold for between uh, 50 million and 150 million. I'd never sold a company in my life. Right. And so that was the vision. That's what I was selling. That was the dream. You know, so it was like, well, OK, well, have you sold a company? Oh, no, not yet. I mean, that's I got my system for that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so it, I had to get through, you know, I wanted the stats of like, OK, here's all the builds. Then then you sell your first company. Then it's like, oh, I can I'm really going to do this. Then the second yeah. one, third one, fourth one. Now it's like now you understand it. Now you've done it. Now you're telling it from you took the time to learn it. You put a vision to it, then you went out and and optimized the system that was going to grow you to your goal, right? And then now today, the way our latest builds that are MindRight and Luso Cloud are super sophisticated builds with great operators, great founder market fit, uh, multi-dimensional CEOs inside. Um, inside really managed constructs of capital staging to make sure you're you have plenty of capital and runway and don't start burning money until you start generating revenue all of these things that were learned um in the early stages what i'd consider the early vintages of companies that were created even though i still have you know six exits and you know outstanding food that's worth over 100 million today from that era it's it's the all of all of the pain points of those process i was able to put into these new builds and everything that i do going forward that makes them being that 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 is allowing them to be have a more solid foundation and find success quicker which will lead to a higher value a quicker growth and a quicker path to a liquidity event right to give you the whole history of it in a long-winded 15 minute run you know <laughs> no, that, that was that was perfect. That's a great way to to explain to the audience what it truly takes to take something that's in your brain and turn it into a reality that you get to exist in. I think that sometimes people cheapen the effort because they 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 only see the the one off stories that are publicized extremely, uh, you know, extremely well, that's like, well, this person started this thing, and then overnight became this giant, huge, you know, success, and they get discouraged and down on themselves uh, too often and uh, end up quitting uh, along along the way. Like there's people like since you've been talking like 2016, I started in entrepreneurship, like uh, uh, online entrepreneurship specifically in 2017. There's people that I know personally, in that four year time frame who have started and stopped mm -hmm. trying to do this. And you were at a point in your career where you didn't have to do this. You didn't have to figure out this business building thing. You're already doing a bunch of stuff. You, you could have cash flowed the money, stopped spending it and reinvesting it and just put it in real estate or something and parked there, continued making money off of, license, uh, off of royalties and uh, you know the, the different content licensing deals that you have out there and just hung it up. But instead, <clears throat> you had a vision for what you wanted out of your life, the value that you wanted to create in the world around you, and then went and found the people and the knowledge that was going to help you get to that level. And then you put in the work that it took to make those things a, a reality. And, and now here we are, what, 17 companies later, $450 million in exits, um, one of them being like a nine-figure exit from your production company that that was from the same company that tried to buy out, that tried to basically buy you 50% of your, you know, everything forever. And now you have your biggest exit to date with that exact, you know, PE firm that tried to buy you before. Like my, my point is, is just saying that like, if you have a dream, if you have a vision, if you have something in your life that you truly want to accomplish, just know that all of these steps in between, this is, this is what separates people who accomplish it and people who don't accomplish it. It's once you move past the sexy parts of it 
and still decide to go to work every day on it because it matters that much to you. Um, and so uh, one thing I, I want to make sure we talk about before uh, we, we jump off here is the structure that you have around your life now. And in, in, in your words, you know, you've, you, you said that, you know, you've done a lot of things, you've been a part of a lot of projects and you have, you know, lived three or four lifetimes in, in a single lifetime. Uh, but now is the part of your life where you said that you, you feel that it's the happiest that you've ever been. And uh, I think that it's, and I think that you would agree, it's a direct result of, again, being intentional about what you want and then building a system that allows you to go get it. So can you talk to us a little bit about how you structure your time, how you structure your, your, your personal life, your family life, your business life, and how it all kind of works together? Because um, you're a, a busy guy that's involved in a lot of things, but you're not too busy to where you're driving yourself crazy and you're living out of balance and not spending time with your family and all those other things. So uh, give us a rundown of what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's when you want to achieve anything, doesn't matter what it is, right? The best way to achieve it is to create a system that can grow you to that goal. And, and the truth is you, you, anything you want to do, any vision that you have, you can, you, 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 the, the actual goal and process of achieving it reveals itself over time to you, right? And so you've got to be patient as you set the big idea, build a, a system or a process that you can, eventually automate and optimize over time that's going to draw you to your vision right and it's going to be there's going to be a a sort of a moment of terminal velocity where you accelerate to the vision like once you've optimized your system in such a way but but the painful part is there you're going to come to a moment where you can now clearly see how much you have to learn, how much you have to do, and how hard it's actually going to be to do it. That is the moment when you have the choice to either double down, put everything in place to organize how you're going to now attack all of that and put in the work and go realize it or where you quit because it's way too hard and way too much work. Because in the beginning, in the fantasize, in the fantasy world, you just see here's what I, here's where I'm at. I want to get here. And I, all I got to do is this, this, and this to get there. But when you do this and this, you realize like, oh my God, like I actually have to do this, 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 and this to get there. And, and that sort of, you know, it's called product market fit in business. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's the reality that there's this chasm that you've got to go through and anything. And I don't care what it is. It's a relationship with a person. It's a, um, it's a new, job it's a, a something new you want to do you you first go through the process of discovering i want to do it then you put some work in and diligence to like what i need to do to do it then you build your kind of plan of how you're going to do it then you launch it you go for it that's when you're in no man's land the moment you launch a company the moment you launch a new idea the moment you take off towards that goal that's when it's like it becomes real and it becomes so much harder than you realize i don't care what it is even these things that you know really well people you know really well different thing when you do something new there is this this sort of shaping process and development process that you have to go through before it becomes more effortless more automated that you can get to a place of optimizing it to where it can become great or special or extraordinary right so i i only say that from when you're looking at at anything you hope to achieve or put a vision to and and that requires an immense amount of learning but i applied that to my life you know, I decided I'm going to live this high energy, amazing, balanced life. And that's where it started. Right. And then, OK, how do I do that? OK, well, I'm going to have to design my time because if I'm going to live balanced, I can't just be I can't just keep like 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 saying yes to all these things and try to and try to balance all of that. I got to begin to build systems. And so I just as essentially I built a financial system, right? I built a time management system. I built a system for my wife. I built a system for how we run our house. I built a, a system for almost everything. And all of these system, a health system, like a, a, a data tracking system that helps give me clarity on how, uh, how 
how I'm feeling and how, 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 what the quality of my life is. I created all of these systems that intertwine together and all are growing towards um, me being the ideal person, living the ideal life that I want to live. Now I designed that in 16 and I grew into it. And part of growing into that was then, oh, all my business visions and all the stuff that I wanted for that, all my financial goals I'm, I've grown into and met, my family goals, my time goals, my health goals, all these things. I grew into that from once I designed it over a, a four or five year period. And so it was my dream life by design that I'm living. And so when you, you create all these systems that are going to help grow you into that, you don't have to keep thinking, what do I got to do to get there? You know that you've just automated them. You just got to make these systems better and learn more and optimize them. And everything grows together into this incredible life, you know, and you, the fulfillment, the like gratitude, the the confidence, the motivation, the all of these intangibles that are these things that like you think are fleeting or, or come with something, you grow inside that system, mm. you know, and, and, you know, I was telling someone the other day, it's like, I, I was just pulling out of my driveway, taking my kids to school and was just overwhelmed with God, you're so lucky. Think of like, you live in this neighborhood you like you get to take your kids to school and to this like great school and like it's part of like your life and system that you create just boom overwhelmed with it i'll be in the shower and be like what like you are just so lucky that this is like where you take a shower you know what i mean and and again it's life by design it's it's the systems are built to create an effortless um existence inside a world of chaos it's bringing order to your universe because your systems and what you need to live that ideal life that yours they're different for everybody yeah. right and it's just a matter of of knowing that you need to build them automate them and optimize them to create true harmony in your life because you're trying to master time uh and capacity so that the output of your systems is high quality energy, right? Because at the end of the day, the quality of your existence will be dictated by the output of the energy that you live in that is the output of those systems that you've created. Because if I was to tell you, imagine a life where you get up every day, fuck, like on fire, and you go from thing to thing to thing all day till you go to sleep on like energized and getting fed energy the entire day, you would be like, it's impossible. That's like just not life. You know what I mean? It's highs and lows, it's highs and lows. And I'm, living proof as someone that went through highs and lows forever and then built systems and still went through highs and lows and systems before they finally grew and built a foundation in such harmony where highs and lows no longer exist mm -hmm. in true energy, peacefulness, gratitude, and happiness is a sustained perpetual state is what's possible with systems. So if someone's listening to this right now and they're like, I'm totally, you know, picking up what you're putting down. I'm listening. I really want to do that. But you keep saying systems and, and processes and all this other stuff, but I genuinely have no idea what that even looks like. Can you give us just a quick example of like what a system looks like to you, like a system that you would build to help you live a happier life or to help your business succeed? What, what does that system look like? How do you build a system? Yeah, I mean, look, I think there's there's a variety of, of different ways. For me, I'm when it came to understanding money and how I would invest money, I built a financial system, right? Hey, this is how I'm going to earn money. Then I'm going to invest money in these syndicated real estate investments, that cash flow, tax to free cash flow that I can 1031 exchange. I'm going to keep my, and my goal is to grow that big enough and keep my living expenses within that because then that creates me the financial freedom 
uh, regardless of my ambitions and, and adventures on my other business stuff and entertainment stuff. And then my goal is to always have five years of cash um, of those expenses to go along with that cash flowing real estate mm. that eventually, what does that give me? That's a system now that I built and then grew. But I did that because it was simple. It was diverse from my high risk ventures that I do in my own business. And it gave me complete and total peace of mind. Yeah. And when you grow that system, when your living expenses are covered by passive your cash income. flowing real estate, yeah. by passive income, and you have five years of those expenses just sitting in cash that people will be like, that's a mistake. Make that money work for you. That money's like giving working for me because it gives me a deep foundation of a peace of mind that it does not matter what happens in my world. Like money will never be a thing to me that I even contemplate. I only focus on growing the system because I, I built the system then made the money and filled it out. And now the system has given me the ultimate freedom. So that was one that I needed like as as a foundation for who I was from um, a wanting um, to to have that security, to always have this pure foundation to to be able to play from playing with the house's money, if you will. Right. Yeah. Sure. And then and then when it comes to living a balanced life, I designed balance. Right. I, I put like the my date nights and talk nights with my wife and the time with my kids. And I put all the time with the executives and I b balanced it out to where I spend 30 percent working of my total time. That's it. And and I did that by by balancing my time in my calendar and then getting better and better at never compromising it. Mm, yeah. Right. Because it's like you can't just decide you want to be balanced. Yeah. And like, I got a balanced system now. This week, I have did my calendar, like Rob said, I'm balanced. And then you got to like, something comes up and you break that balance and you got to go into doing something. It's like, you have to grow into that and get really good at that. And, and again, like, but you have to start somewhere. You have to start with the, the commitment, you know, no different than like, you know, the hardest thing about being healthy is, is having a clean diet and working out. Right. So for me, like I, I started, you know, using qualitative data. How do I feel zero to 10 about life, work and health to begin to give me an understanding of the, of how I feel about the quality of my life. And, but what I began to realize is if I, these core things, getting up at five, um, getting um having a clean diet not drinking meditating brain training and getting in the gym every time i did that consistently it drove up my qualitative numbers of how i felt about my life work and health hmm. so it became undeniable right and so for me i i gamified my system by now tracking it every day and then doing it by percentages so now I can look at every month over month by percentages of like how consistent I was. And then I became motivated by working the number and then by becoming so consistent in that system, what eventually happened? I don't even think about it. It's my way of life. It became yeah. a habit. The system turned it into a habit. The habit became a way of life. Yeah. I don't even know. Like, like when you look at my data today, like when you look across this entire year of how many uh, days in the year did I have a clean diet, not drink, meditate, get in the gym, get up before five uh, and brain train, it is like 90% of the year. It's not like, it's not like in, in that, keep in mind, that is seven days a week. You know what I mean? There, I don't look at like, oh, it's the weekend. It's my time off. My, I don't have like, I don't look at it like, oh, my cheat day. It's like, this is the way that I live. Then the output is quantifiable quality of life. Mm, when yeah. you look at like, and, and I would, if I didn't create a system of tracking how I feel, right? And just, and, and to me, I, and, and it's complex for a lot of people, but if you just each day, how do I feel about my life? zero to 10 and five being neutral. You're, you're, you could take it or leave it. Anything below five being like, 
I wish I would have never started this podcast. I should have never even been in. I should have went to college and done this. I should have, yeah, I should have been a, a pastor. You know what I mean? Like I, you know, I, uh, you know, you, you decide I shouldn't have bought that couch. Right. Like and when you're half empty, like you literally can pick apart so many things and it's a, it, it, it turns into this rabbit hole. When you're neutral, you're, 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 you're not hopeful. You're not negative, but when you're above a five, man, it, it sky's the limit. You're on your way. Anything's possible. Like, okay. Yeah. It sucks that I got in a car wreck today, but we're still cooking. Got this moving, got that moving. Right. Like, and to me, just, if you just did that, you'll begin to notice that like the things that pull you down and put you in that half empty feeling, like they are the same few things. And it becomes super clear on what you can change. So, so I did that first for years, cleared all those out. Now I was always, almost always above a five. Now I'm living in this really elevated state. Then, mm-hmm. then there were times when I was super elevated, super productive, felt extraordinary. And then I began to see in, that those were tied to when I was really consistent on diet and working out and meditating and these things. And I'm like, man, you got to build a system to make sure you do that. And that's going to take you to another level. Then I went to a complete other level. And in all the time, I grew into that. I started this the same time frame in 2015 as I was designing the machine, designing my life plan, my life system. I launched them all together and they all grew together. Mm. So it wasn't like all of a sudden I tried any of these systems as I was going I began to change the system, optimize the system, create a new system within a system that kept elevating and driving me to get to this state. And so to me, it's as simple as just beginning to look at parts of your life that you know, if you could systematize that it would benefit you. Yeah. And, and they're, they're, they're true to you and, and, and just be getting used to seeing what that does. And then you'll see like, Oh, I could make this better by doing this. Mm. And that's where optimization comes in because you can't optimize anything until you automate it. Right. Because when it's, when, when you just keep trying to figure out, or it's like, you're starting over every time, like you can't, you can't optimize it because you're, you're just trying to get it done. You're trying to get yourself to do it. You're trying yeah. to get there versus what greatness and in all things extraordinary happen in optimization of great systems, the triangle offense, the Patriot way, all of these, these, these things that like seem seemingly are just these constructs that then like really talented people can optimize inside those constructs to be great. You know what I mean? Yeah. So seems like it always starts with clarity around what you're wanting to get out of life, right? What you want to get out of your business, what you want to get out of your personal life. And then, and then taking action and then automating and then optimizing, and then going back and making sure that you're still clear about what you want in life, that that's still the goal, right? Cause I mean that it would suck to do that for five years and then get to the goal and be like, Oh, I, I didn't want this, (laughs) you know, I should have changed this. Hey, and look, you wouldn't, that's not possible. Because now you're living a life of such an intention. If you're leading intention, towards yeah, the, that's the word. you know what I'm saying? Like your 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 the vision of the goal will will begin to expand, mm. right? Like you know the the way that I when I launched it, I said I would never write a book. I don't want to be a teacher. I'm not going to do a podcast. Like I'm not like all these things of like I just want to build like and. Like, but then as I grew and became, it's like, man, I want to share this with people, yeah, right? Yeah. Like, I really think that this can help people. Like, and so now it's like, that became part of the process. Then I reached a level of wealth in such a short amount of time. And I had children that like, holy moly, like, I forget about like, like self-preservation. How can I like create a, a, a system for generations yeah. of, of beard X, right. And a multi-generational uh, preservation mindset, like all of you begin to expand and change. Now the core ideas of, of what I wanted to do and become did not change, but it's okay if they do. Right. Because you, 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 as you grow and it unfold into an idea, like if you don't want to do that, 
you can change that idea, but it's not like you're changing your entire life plan. Mm -hmm. Like you, you have built your life systems now, like in, in the, it, what you do for work or earn money may change in that life system, but your, the, the vision that you have for what will make you happy will only evolve. Like, it's not going to completely be like, okay, like, no, I don't want a family and kids. Um, you know, I want to, you know, get a boat and, and, and live by myself in the Mediterranean. You're never going to go that far away uh, from what is your ideal vision for the way that you want to live. You, you have a pretty good idea of, of what it is at an early age. It just evolves through your experiences and opportunities over time. You know, you have a new show coming out with my wife. It's called figuring it out. And this is basically the entire premise of the show is to get people to move from a position of thinking that it's possible to just have it figured out and moving them into this idea that look, life is literally the journey and it's a constant, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a constant battle of continuing to figure it out along the way. And that's just, that's all, that's all we're trying to do. That's all any of us are trying to do is just figure it out for ourselves. And, uh, I, I appreciate you being willing to come on the show and share some of these things because, uh, it's a lot easier to figure things out if you have a system that helps you get to the goal that you have rather than just, you know, taking off from a Harbor in New York and hoping that you land in London, you know, it's just like, well, it's probably pretty low odds that that's going to happen. And, uh, you can't get mad at anybody else, but yourself, if that's the case. But listen, man, I appreciate you coming on the show. I want to be respectful of your time and uh, let you get out of here back to your family and everything. Um, uh, it, just for everybody listening to this right now, if you guys enjoy the show, please go check out Rob's show, Build with Rob. Um, whenever whenever I see somebody that I've been following for a while launch a podcast, just because this is kind of the space that I live in, I always have to go check out the show. And I have to tell you guys, this one will not disappoint. Uh, he interviews a lot of really great founders that he's worked with. He's interviewed now a lot of founders uh, that, uh, that weren't great fits for the machine, but he still tries to give value and offer, offer advice around some of those things. So especially if you're a founder, entrepreneur, uh, uh, creator, go check out Build with Rob, whatever podcast player you're listening to right now. Rob, thanks so much for coming on the show, man. This was awesome. 